Hey everyone, it's Andrew. Welcome back to my channel on Everything Books. Today we're going to be discussing the book The Portable Dante by Mark Musa. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a longer video and it's going to kind of be a little bit different. So um, I recently read The Divine Comedy or The Portable Dante about two months ago. Um, this was kind of random after trying to read Dante's Inferno for about 12 years. Um, the reason being is I'll show you. I had a translation of the Dante's Inferno uh, by Long, uh, the Longfellow translation um, for about 10 years on my bookshelf. And what I ended up happening, what ended up happening was I would pick this book up, I'd open up to the first canto, and repeatedly every single time I'd read like the first canto and just not understand what was going on. It feel like pulling teeth, and I'd ultimately put it down just because it was not a pleasurable experience. So about two months ago, I ended up pulling this off my shelf for like the whatever, sixth, seventh, eighth time, whatever it might be, with the intention of reading it, and the exact same thing happened. And ultimately what ended up happening was I ended up Googling online, kind of saying like, how do you read Dante's Inferno or tips on reading Dante's Inferno, things like that. And on Google, I found a lot of information related to this and ultimately it really pointed to finding the best translation and finding a book that was uh, more suitable for kind of what you're gonna get out of it. And so in this video, what we'll do is I'm gonna discuss um, a couple tips when reading um, Dante's Inferno and the Divine Comedy. Um, first, we'll discuss how to pick a translation. Then we'll pick, um, discuss kind of like details regarding like how to approach reading this. And then we'll discuss kind of like a general synopsis of the story. I'm not gonna do a concise review. I'm not gonna do anything super academic. I'm not gonna go into the book in detail regarding that. Um, really, this is just gonna be tailored towards those of you that are interested in reading either Dante's Inferno or the Divine Comedy um, at a, at, from a leisurely perspective as far as just for pleasure and enjoyment of understanding the storyline. Um, this is not for an academic purposes or anything like that. So for those of you that are interested in more of an academic review, you'll have to refer to somebody else's synopsis or things like that. Um, but we'll just get started regarding kind of like discussing the story and how to approach it. Tip number one, um, after I Googled online, um, looking at different translations, I had the Longfellow version. And then ultimately um, the advice online was essentially trying to find out which translation is most, most appropriate for you. And so after reviewing all the translations on like one of the websites, I end up going to Barnes and Noble. I took out all the Dante's Inferno books off the shelf and I essentially compared them side by side uh, to look at the text and figure out which one did I feel like was most appropriate for what I wanted to get out of the book. And so the, the thing, main thing you want to know is that Dante's Divine Comedy, um, he wrote it in 1306. Um, it's an epic poem where it's written in Italian because um, he was in Tuscany at the time and he wrote wrote it with a very particular rhyming scheme, um, which was new at that time. And what happened because of that is that over the past 700 years or so, this has been passed on generation to generation very easily because his um, rhyming pattern is so particular. And so the nice part about that is people that can come back and translate this later on, they can translate it very well, either from a poetic standpoint or a prose standpoint, um, really with the intention of even either maintaining the poetry, which is very difficult um, because of the rhyming scheme, or kind of emphasizing the prose. So when you look at different translations, you'll find there's certain books that are really focused on the poetic aspect of it and maintaining the, the overall theme of the story, or there's ones that say, all right, we're not going to focus on the poetry aspect and we'll really just do prose and get the overall details of the story um, together. Um, I'm not going to go into nuances as far as one translation to the other. That's something that's academic and there's people that spend their whole scholarly career focusing on that. But that's one thing you do have to focus on when you look at this, is whether do you want to read a poem or do you want to read it in prose? And what would you appreciate more when it comes to that? The next part is really looking at 
uh, for translations, which one is easiest for you to read or which one is tailored towards your reading style. So when I went to Barnes and Noble, I essentially pulled these off the shelf and I what I did was I pulled up the first canto and made a side-by-side -side comparison and read each, uh, each one from one book to the next. And I ultimately picked the Mark Musa translation, which is the portable Dante, uh, which encompasses all three stories for Dante's Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradiso or Paradise um, in one book. Um, there was a different version where I think it, it, that I was looking at where it very, very essentially had um, the original text by Dante side by side with a translation. And that one I was almost tempted to get. The only reason why I did not was because it did not encompass all three books. So I felt like I would have to come back and pick out pur uh, the book for Purgatory as well as um, Paradise and figure out which translation I wanted to read at that point. Um, so really I put the pick the portable Dante because it has the entire Divine Comedy in one book. Um, so I don't have to ever come back and pick another book again. And that really tailors it, tailors it to make sure that I read this in its entirety. I picked the Mark Musa translation. The, what I'll do right now is I'm gonna read a side-by-side -side comparison to give you an idea of why the translation makes uh, matters so much. Um, but for... Um, for the Divine Comedy, essentially um, Dante wrote this book so that there's three separate parts. There's going to be 34 cantos or paragraphs uh, for um, the Divine Comedy, then there's going to be 33 cantos for Purgatory, and then 33 cantos for Paradiso or Paradise, and it encompasses a total of 100 different cantos, um, each one of which I think has 150 lines. And so structurally, that's how it originally was written, that's how it was intended to be read, and the whole journey um, encompasses all that. It doesn't stop at Dante's Inferno. So um, it, what you'll learn is that Dante goes through hell, which is the Inferno. He ends up going through hell and then he ends up at the mountain of purgatory and then he goes through purgatory he ends up at the garden of eden and then he goes into heaven so dante intended to re write this with the intention of going through the entire journey so i don't really understand why you would read like just Dante's Inferno and stop there. I really like the value of reading or coming to this book with the intention of reading it in its entirety um, because that's how he intended to write it and that's really how the story lays out. You can't just stop at hell because he's literally on the on the steps of purgatory. Um, but regardless, we'll read um, each translation. I'll give you a sense of why the translation matters. Um, what I'll read is, um, this is the Longfellow translation, so I'll read about like 15 lines or so, just so you get an understanding of the verbiage and why it was so difficult for me to read um, when I was picking up this book repeatedly. Um, but so this is Canto 1, so it says, um, Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself with in a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Ah, me, how hard a thing it is to say, what was this forest, savage, rough, and stern, which in the very thought renews the fear. So bitter is it, death is, is little more, but of the good to treat, which there I found, speak will I of the other things I saw there. I cannot well repeat how there I entered, so full was I of slumber at at the moment in which I had abandoned the true way. Um, so that is the Longfellow translation. When I first read this, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? I don't understand what's going on. Um, and I don't know what's going on. It's very difficult. The verbiage is very hard to read as a lay person. And ultimately what happened was I'd read one to three cantos and I put this down and never pick it up. Um, so that's the Longfellow translation. Um, I'll kind of explain what the, what the backstory on this is. Versus this is the um, this is the portable Dante by Mark Musa, the one I ultimately read. Um, so we'll read this exact same thing in, in the Mark Musa translation. So this says, uh, Midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, for I had wandered off from the straight path. How hard it is to tell what it was like, this wood of wilderness savage and stubborn. The thought of it brings back all my old fears. A bitter place death could scarce be bit bitter but if I could sh or, or sorry but if I would show the good that came of it I must talk about things other than the good how I entered there I cannot truly say I had become so sleepy at the moment when I first strayed leaving the path of truth 
So that's a side-by-side -side comparison of the first canto. And um, as you can tell, the Longfellow one, the verbiage is a little bit more difficult. It's trying to emphasize the poetic nature a little bit more. And for me personally, it was very difficult to comprehend. So I couldn't understand what was going on versus the Mark Musa translation is more prose. It focuses on just the context of it. And it's much more like focused on English uh, as a language. But in general, the synopsis here is that basically um, Dante starts off the story where he's halfway through his life, um, which is the midway uh, along the journey of my life. I woke to find myself in a dark wood, um, which essentially is there's a lot of um, symbolism between dark, which is like sinful life versus light being like God and heaven, heavenly, like a, a sinless life, where um, if you're in dark, it's like you're on a path of sin versus if you're in light, it's God kind of guiding you the way. So at this point in his life, Dante's um, halfway through his life, he's led this path of of, um, being sinful and he is straight away from like the straight path to God and so he's in this like wilderness or dark wood where it's just savagery wilderness and stubbornness and he has this fear related to it and so regardless that's that's the general sense of this which is very I think it's understandable from the Mark Musa translation versus the Longfellow translation it's very difficult um, so that's the first advice I have is pick a translation that you can easily read just pull them off the shelf pick one and then you go with that um, the other advice I have is um, what I end up finding was the with the Mark Musa translation, the nice thing about this is that, as you can tell, um, he has it structured so that in every single canto, there's going to be about a like a paragraph to two paragraphs that provides a quick summary of what that canto entails. If So it basically kind of preps you for the canto, walks you through everything that happens, and then when you get to the actual um, prose or poetic um, like canto aspect of it and the lines, you kind of come to it with a general understanding of what's going to happen. So for those of you that have never read this before, you kind of know what's going to happen. There's a summary already, and you can kind of put it together very easily. It's to the point where you can almost read just the summaries alone and get a good understanding of the entire story without even having to read the actual lines, which is nice. Um, the other thing I, I, I would recommend is, um, or the reason why I picked this compared to other translations is all the annotations or in-text annotations are on each page, uh, which is a nice feature because you can always reference those immediately, either as you're reading or later on um, after you complete it. So personally what I ended up doing was I would read the summary, I'd read all the lines for the canto, and then I'd come back and read the annotations at the bottom. Um, the nice feature about this is that you, the, it, you don't have to flip back and it makes it very seamless and streamlined to read it. Um, compared to, for instance, the Longfellow translation here, um, where essentially they have all of the annotations at the end of the book. Um, so what I ended up having to do is I'd have to like flip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which just me, makes it a like unpleasant reading experience. So um, that was another reason why I like the Mark Musso translation. So that's one thing. So um, as we discussed, pick poem, poetry, pick a translation that you like, show a side-by-side -side comparison, look at the font, the text, the structure of the book, see which one you like most or you would prefer, and then go with that one. Um, the other thing I would like recommend is definitely um, the, the second tip I have is come to this with the intention of reading the Divine Comedy in its entirety. Um, either by getting like the Portable Dante where it has all three books together or picking up all three books separately within a certain translation or if you're gonna jump from one translation to the next. Um, buy them all at once and have them so that you can come to this with the thought process that you're going to read it in its entirety because that's how Dante intended it. It is a tire journey that encompasses all that. It doesn't just stop at the end of Inferno or Purgatory. You have to go the whole way. And so coming to it with reading it that way, I think there's value that with that versus if you just stop at the Inferno, you're just kind of like never finishing the story, which is kind of stupid. Um, so either way, so come to it with reading it in all its entirety. I'll say that from personal preference um, with the portable Dante with, with Mark Musa, if I were to rate like the Inferno, Purgatory, and um, Paradise separately, I'll say that for the Inferno, his translation was like a five out of five 
absolutely amazing for um, Inferno. Um, the imagery, the vividness, the like, there's just a guttural reaction of what you're witnessing and seeing with how it's described. So his Inferno copy was great. Um, Purgatory, I felt that what ended up happening was um, it just kind of dwindled a little bit where it wasn't as good as Inferno. Like it was kind of more like self-reflective and it, the imagery wasn't as good. There's just like not that much context there. And so I, I would rate that about it, like three out of five stars. And then for Paradise, I'd rate it like a two out of five, um, largely being that like Paradise ends up being just like repeatedly just people coming that rep like as representations of light and then Dante having discussions with these random figures over and over again and just didn't provide much value at that point. Um, whether that's a translation thing, I personally do not know because this is my first time ever reading the Divine Comedy. I have not read a different translation. Um, so I can't really so tell you whether it was specific to Mark Moose's translation or just simply the fact that Dante really didn't develop Purgatory or Paradise as much as he did for the Inferno. Um, that's something that I'd have to read another translation to get the full extent of an understanding of that. However, Mark Moose's translation, because it's simple with the summaries, the, um, the having the cantos there and the in-text annotations, it was a very, very easy, simple read where you could comprehend it very easily. If you're like a lay person, non-academic person that just wants to read this translation, get a general sense of what happens in the Divine Comedy and then kind of walk away with this from with the, the full extent of the context in which it plays a role in like world literature and like society as a whole because it's been around for 700 years and really you should read this at some point in your life. Um, so that's as far as picking a translation that's as far as this translation itself as far as structure and things like that. Um, now what we're going to do is my next advice is my third main thing, topic of advice is read the introduction, okay? So this is interesting because I never read introductions for books. Usually I, what I do is I literally flip, flip through the introduction, go straight to page one, and I start reading there. And I'm like, why should I read an introduction? It's just like a bunch of some academic person randomly saying like all this information on the backstory of a book or a classic, and I'm like, I don't really care. And it usually puts me to sleep before I even start the book. So I usually skip it. However, this is the first book I probably in my entire life that I read the introduction and provided huge value and context for the story. And that's because you really, when, when approaching the Divine Comedy, you really have to understand the context in which Dante wrote it. Um, so Dante it, it wrote the Divine Comedy in the 1300s in Florence, Italy. And at that time period, there was a lot of um, political strife between different political parties. And there were two separate parties of the Gil or Guelphs at that time. And he was part of one party and ultimately he was exiled from Florence, Italy. And he wrote the Divine Comedy while he was exiled. And so throughout the entire Divine Comedy, what you'll find is there's different random Italian people either before his life or after his life that are placed into this story and you're like who are these people but they're all relevant to Dante and his life at that time so it's rather fascinating that Dante essentially takes these characters that either were positive or never negative influences in his life and then throughout the entire afterlife as he goes through it he places them and hands picks where he's gonna put these people in either hell purgatory or heaven based on his experience and what like how they treated him in his life or how they treated bef people before is like so that plays a huge role on this storyline and kind of like backstory on who these people are and why and so when you it, it, they reference like random families and things like that that's where that all stems from which is very important to the story because this is like a very personal story for Dante and he's kind of sharing like that aspect of his life so definitely read the introduction that provides context there the other next thing that you mainly take away from the introduction is understanding who Beatrice is um, so Beatrice Beatrice is like the main, the whole, like if you, once you read this, you actually understand that Dante is like Dante's Inferno and Dante is divine comedy is like the ultimate love story or poem or um, like poem to Beatrice. 
Um, so Beatrice was this girl that Dante met. Um, ultimately, he met her around when he was eight years old. They became estranged or they went separate ways. And then ultimately, Beatrice passes away um, and dies. And Dante probably went through a period of depression for about two years. And during that time period, he had the full intention of becoming a poet. And he comes back from that period of depression and he commits in his mind to say, I'm going to write the best, most, like, best epic poem ever dedicated to Beatrice. And knowing that this is like a love story where he basically writes this poem saying that Beatrice, um, Beatrice who has passed away is now in heaven and she comes and because Dante is on a path towards hell and sin and he's going to spend his entire entirety uh, like eternity in hell because he's not living the right path or straight path in his life. Um, Beatrice basically sends Virgil who um, wrote the Aeneid to guide Dante through the afterlife, through hell, purgatory, and heaven to witness what happens there so that later on he can kind of re live the rest of his life um, on a path towards going to heaven. And so that's the full story is Beatrice sent Virgil to guide Dante and put him on the right path. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Um, but really, it's like a love story. He wrote this poem as a love story and a, a dedication to Beatrice. So that's the important aspect, too. So you understand who Beatrice is, why she's an important character. And ultimately, what happens is Virgil guides um, Dante through he hell as well as purgatory. And then because Virgil cannot enter heaven, he passes off Dante um, to Beatrice and Beatrice guides him through heaven. Um, so that's important context. The third main takeaway I'd say from the introduction and which plays a huge context is the concept or understanding that there is Dante the um, pilgrim who is the person actually going through um, the like through each of the realms of the afterlife and experiencing it and witnessing it real time. And then there's Dante the poet. And then Dante the poet is really the person coming back after this entire journey, sitting down and writing that big poem. And so you'll have nuances where while you're reading this, it's pretty fascinating where Dante writes this where you can see the perspective of Dante the pilgrim as he's experiencing it, as he's evolving, as he witnesses these things, especially in the first where you see his whole demeanor towards the damned or the people in hell change throughout that experience. Um, and so you witness how Dante the Pilgrim changes throughout the entire journey throughout from like initially when he first starts all the way to when he ends. Um, so that's one aspect. But then meanwhile, he'll intersperse it where it's a from the perspective of Dante the poet who's actually writing the story. And he'll provide little um, reflections or comments real time within the story where you You've got this plot twist where it's like Dante the the poet or Dante the pilgrim and kind of the perspective and you'll literally change it from one section to the other. So that's very important to know as well because Dante the pilgrim is experiencing this. He's never experienced it before. He's going through it the first time. So you get like you get like an emotional or humanistic response to what you're witnessing versus um, Dante the poet has already seen this. He's writing it down. He's documenting it. So there's some nuances there. And those are the three takeaways I'd say from reading the introduction that provide huge value to this. So I'd say I read this introduction, I read the introduction on this one, um, and I also read a couple like summaries online to get a general understanding and that provided huge value in understanding what this story was about. Um, so those are my general tips as far as reading it. So pick a translation, pick a book that you think is most convenient for you, um, understand like read the introduction, get a good context of the story. And then also um, end up like choosing a book that has all of them in its entirety. Um, now what we'll do is we'll just generally discuss the book and my review of kind of the overall story and the backstory as far as the synopsis. So Dante, the portable Dante starts off with Dante's Inferno. Dante is at the base of a mountain. He starts going up the mountain and he comes across three beasts that prevent him from going up the mountain. Um, and the symbolism is that by going up the mountain, he's essentially going towards God, but he's uh, coming out of these woods where he's like sinful and so Beatrice has sent Virgil to guide Dante through the afterlife and kind of witness what encompasses or what happens there so he has an understanding of 
what he's potentially in for when he dies if he continues on this path of sin. And so Beatrice is trying to save his life by having him go on a path towards going to heaven. And so Virgil guides him through the afterlife, through infer the Inferno and Purgatory. I'll say that during um, the Inferno, this is absolutely one of the most captivating, most vivid, um, best imagery I've ever seen. Um, like he goes through the nine circles of hell. He basically witnesses what punishment are in like for each level of hell and the type of sin that is kind of placed there and Dante is very particular about putting what type of sin what the like punishment is and a lot of those are very suited towards what it might be so um, the best I'm not gonna walk through them one by one because there's detailed reviews of this but um, for example like people that commit suicide um, in the in the church essentially sees them as committed to going to hell and so they're they're placed in a situation where where they're converted to trees and their limbs can break off and bleed and they can experience pain. In certain particular ones, there's like these wolves and huntsmen that are basically tracking down certain ones. So um, the example is at one point, like uh, like somebody runs through the bush, the bushes limbs break and they start bleeding and you experience torture and pain from that. Um, but it's, it's kind of like Dante's Inferno is super grotesque and very, very human. Um, I'll describe it as like, when you read this as a, as a human being, you can kind of witness like, or feel what it would be like to be in that situation, be committed to eternity and have no way out where you're damned to repeat the same pain over and over and over again. And these things like, they're very, physical in nature. Um, physical, emotional, even like um, mental, like the anguish that those people are experiencing is very, very vivid. And it's a, there's a humanistic quality to it, which is why I think Dante's Inferno stands out most because people read that, they experience it, and then they kind of don't continue with Purgatory or Paradise maybe. And which is why Inferno stands out the most is because it's hell and this is like the damned and what, what might happen to you if you lead a path of sin. Um, regardless, Dante's Inferno, I absolutely recommend reading no matter what. I mean, I think that's by far the best part. Um, it was amazing. This book, The Portable Dante, five out of five stars without a doubt for the Inferno. Um, so at, for the Inferno, he goes through hell. He ends up, hell basically takes you through the middle of the earth and then um, the devil is at the middle of the earth. And then he comes out the other side and ends up on um, at the base of purgatory, which is a mountain. And what we'll do is, um, I'll flip to it, I think it's, let me, sorry. Um, but Purgatory is a mountain where it's, here it is, just so you can see the imagery. But um, Purgatory is essentially a mountain where there's different levels on the side of the mountain that are committed to different kind of sins or um, wrongs that people do throughout their life. But it's a little bit different than hell. Um, so um, I might misspeak because I don't know this well enough, but the understanding is that, um, my understanding is that uh, initially what would happen is if somebody sinned and they were not, so hell is really committed to those who sin and are not on a path towards God or not right with God. So they end up going to hell and they have no way out. They're there for eternity. There's no way for re like absolution. They can't ever lead towards heaven or get out of their situation. So they're damned there no matter what for eternity until the world ends. Um, versus purgatory is really set up for those that were right with God or the church and they sinned or did wrongs throughout their life. However, they in generally, like generally were right with, right with the church or, or God. And so rather than going to hell and being damned, they have a way out where they essentially have to travel along purgatory on the different levels um, for, and kind of commit like a certain level of like they have to basically undo their wrongs by just serving time here and serving throughout this entire these different levels until they get to the top and at the top is the garden of eden and once they make it there they basically can get into heaven and go to paradise um the interesting thing is purgatory is a little bit different where um, from my experience reading it at least, it's more of like self-reflective I would describe, which is very appropriate for the situation because um, what happens on each level is like there's a, like a, they have to serve in some way where um, 
they they have to serve whatever they're, they're required to do however it's more of like a time commitment and a reflective nature of what they did throughout their life and it's much less physical so hell is like a physical anguish versus um purgatory is just more of repeatedly like you're serving kind of like your time and your duty and reflection and kind of you move on to the next level it's much less torturous so the the Sorry, my camera stopped on its own. Um, so the requirements in purgatory are much less severe. Um, they're less physical and they're less like like guttural. It's more of just like you go through the process and you end up kind of making it to the top of the garden of Eden, even Eden, and then you make it to heaven. Um, in general, I would rate this book in general, like uh, Purgatory, at least the Mark Musa translation, like a three out of five stars. Like it's relatable, you can understand it, but it's just not the same as in the Inferno. Um, the one and it's just not as vivid, the imagery and things like that. I'd say that at the end of it though, the probably the best part of it is when um, Dante makes it to the top, he's in the Garden of Eden, and there it's very, the imagery goes back to exactly how it was in the Inferno. It's very vivid, um, there's a ton of symbolism. Um, there's a whole ceremony in which like people go to heaven, they open the gates of, he like, gates of heaven and they make it there. And like, the, it's just like this whole ceremonious aspect and there's so much symbolism there and Mark Musa does a really good job of explaining the symbolism so you understand what each kind of person or like like symbol represents and so that was like that part like the last two cantos purgatory was on par with the inferno as far as the representation the imagery and things like that but the rest of it just wasn't it didn't have the same like it didn't stand out as much um, so that was purgatory and then lastly what I'll do is I'll discuss Paradiso which I personally did not like paradise so um, after Dante goes to purgatory he ends up in paradise he meets Beatrice and Beatrice is his guide now through heaven and heaven like you go through the inferno and purgatory in anticipation of going at heaven heaven and you think it's gonna be like this great imagery um, but it ends up just being kind of like flat um, essentially Dante Dante goes to paradise or heaven and really heaven encompasses the celestial stars and, and space virtually. Um, so he basically goes into space, he ends up on the moon, the different planets, and then what I assume is that at, at that time they did not know all the planets, so they just kind of like run out of the local planets and he ends up in heaven where like the the different levels of heaven and ends up kind of like meeting mary and the saints and things like that and and ultimately sees god um but paradise ends up just being i would describe it as a period like a huge discussion of old Italian people that you don't really care about because it's just like random people that Dante knew about in his life and it's just not relatable as much and then all these people they're met in a similar fashion where like a bunch of light comes in which is like their souls are reflected as light and Dante's talking to these light lights that come and they represent some important person in either historically or in his life and that's all paradise and then at the end of it paradise um essentially like paradise is set up where um all the important people in like the church and things like that um in heaven are kind of seated in what i guess these rose petals and then they're kind of sitting around in a circle and at the top of it is god and like dante sees God um, and then it kind of ends but paradise it just wasn't the same as the rest of the storyline it was just kind of like two out of five stars wasn't that great however I'll say that like the whole story was worthwhile reading I mean this thing has been around for 700 years it's been passed on there's thousands of different images and story depictions from this in mainstream media we reflect to, or re like reflect on Dante all the time it's referenced in stories like I remember reading or watching like seven that movie and it's all about Dante's Inferno and things like that um, so it's a huge context is is with Dante and the portable Dante and Divine Comedy so it's something that I highly recommend reading either from a, a spiritual or religious standpoint or just a cultural standpoint um, but that's really my general sense and summary I know it's been a long-winded video or for this however Dante's Inferno and the Divine Comedy I think deserves it um, so in summary what I'll say is 
when it comes to reading Dante's Inferno or the Divine Comedy, definitely re figure out which translation is best for you, either prose or poetry, depending on your intention and what you want to get out of the story. If you've never read it before, I do recommend the Mark Musa translation. It's good summary. It's simple. It provides the summary at the top of the page. It goes through the cantos and it has in-text citations that work very well for understanding it. Um, if it, you need something more academic, you're not even going to reference my video, but you'll have to find some translation that's probably more detailed. Um, the Longfellow is like the original one, and that's probably why this is like the Barnes and Noble classic. However, I found it super difficult to read. So pick a translation that works for you and something that you'll enjoy reading, especially for the first time. Um, coming off of the Mark Musa translation, I could probably read the Longfellow now that I have general understanding of what the story is about and the nuances of one translation to the next because I have the background and I have the context so I can now directly compare one translation to the next. But for the first time reading it, I do recommend picking a simple one that you're going to read and you're going to enjoy because if you don't want, don't want to read it, it feels like you're pulling teeth and you're not going to enjoy it, you're never going to finish it. And there's no point to that. So the Mark Musa translation works really for, well for that. So pick a translation that you want. Um, pick one that's structurally like how you like it. The next set of advice is pick a, come to reading the Divine Comedy with the intention of reading all of it. That's how Dante intended it. The story does not end at the end of the Inferno. It goes on with Purgatory and Paradise. And he originally wrote it with a hundred cantos in mind because that's how he wanted this epic poem to be written. You wouldn't even meet Beatrice if you don't make it to paradise. So it's very important to kind of come to this with the intention of reading all 100 cantos, um, either in part or kind of separately to get the full story from one, the beginning to the end and understand what Dante experiences. So that's my second tip of advice. The third tip of advice is read the introduction. That gives huge context as far as the political aspect, how where Dante was in his life when he wrote this, the whole fact that he was exiled from Italy and is writing this in exile. Um, it gives you context on who Beatrice is, the fact that he dedicated writing this as an epic poem for her and that provides context there. And then additionally, it gives you the whole conception of why, or like the difference between Dante the Pilgrim and Dante the Poet, because that's huge. And it gives you really like interesting nuances to what's going on when you're reading this and kind of how the perspective changes um, for Dante the Pilgrim as he's going through the journey, and then Dante the Poet as he's writing it later on. And then the next step of advice is just kind of like read it and enjoy it. I mean, that's all I have though. I mean, so sorry for the long video, but that is The Portable Dante by Mark Musa or The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. It's been around for 700 years. It's been huge in our um, mainstream media, our like world literature over time. And so I highly recommend reading this at some point. Pick a translation that works for you. Read it at some point. It will be a pleasurable experience. I definitely enjoyed this. I think it was a, 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 a definitely a once in a lifetime experience at least reading it. And it's, sometime, it's something where I might come back and read another translation just for the fascination of how it varies from one uh, copy to the next. Because this translation was good, but still like Paradise and Purgatory were not as good. So it'd be interesting to read a different translation and say, was it the Mark Musa translation or was it that Dante never really fully fleshed out and finished off like Purgatory and Paradiso as well as he did for in the Inferno. I won't know until I read another translation. So sorry for the long video, but that's my concept, my uh, general tips and advice and review of um, the Portable Dante by um, Mark Musa. Uh, if you like this video, please like um, below. If you have comments, questions, anything like that, please post them below. I am not an expert on Dante's Inferno. I am not an academic person. I'm just somebody reading this book for leisure. Uh, so I probably misspoke throughout this video, but I hope it guided you if you're interested in reading this book. So please like, and if you're interested in watching more of my videos regarding books, uh, you can subscribe to my channel as well. So thanks for watching and have a great day.